Welcome to the second half of our Survey of the Bible course as we teach you the New Testament books, places, story, people, and periods. I've got to tell you, we've got lots of surprises planned for you as we help you speed learn the New Testament. As we get started, let's take a quick look at three basic facts regarding the books of the New Testament. Number one, the New Testament contains 27 books. Those 27 books are contained with four biographies, one history, and 22 letters. That's four biographies, one history, and 22 letters. And the last book, the book of Revelation, is also a book of prophecy. Number two, the New Testament records events and letters that span approximately 100 years. 100 years. And number three, the New Testament was written by eight authors. Eight authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude. And those books were written from modern day locations like Israel and Turkey, Greece, Rome, and the ancient island of Patmos. But now let's move back to the Bible library room. You're going to really enjoy learning the organization of the books of the New Testament. Welcome back to the Bible library. <laughs> this is great. Well, look at the library of the New Testament that I've placed all 27 books of the New Testament right here on my table. But when you think about all 27 books, they could look a little bit overwhelming, can't they? But as you learned in the previous session, you're soon going to learn how the parts of the New Testament fit together easily and quickly. Well, just like the Old Testament, the New Testament is not organized according to when these books were written. For instance, the book of James, the book of James way back here, was written before Matthew. And the book of John was written after Hebrews and Peter and even Jude. You see, the New Testament books are not organized by the time they occurred, but by the type of book that they are. So as we come to the New Testament, how would you say it's organized if you had to explain to somebody? And how many parts are there in the New Testament library? And what are they called? And how many books are in each part? Well, thanks for asking those questions because we're going to answer them. There are basically two types of New Testament books. Look at this library for a minute. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are historical books. And from Acts on, from Romans all the way to Revelation, these are all letters. And as you'll see, the New Testament letters, these letters at the end, are grouped in three different categories. Well, let's go over here and see if we can't draw this out for you, because the New Testament can be arranged like an arch. An arch. Let's, let's see if we can't draw that for you. Here's the foundation of our arch. And there are two columns on either side of our arch. This is a foundation, two columns, and there's a roof on top. That's how I've structured the New Testament. And on the bottom, on the bottom, the, this is called the historical books. And there are five of them. And on the left-hand side, there's a column that has nine books. And this other column has the same number as this side. It has nine. And nine and nine are 18, right? And there are 27 books in the New Testament. And nine and nine is 18. And we need a third nine to make 27. And five and four is the other one. So there's a nine and there's a nine. Got it? Here's the foundation, column one, column two, and the top. These are letters, letters, and letters. These are all letters. And these are our historical books. Well, let's, let's see if we can't look at it a little bit more carefully in your workbook. The bottom part, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts are called the historical books, and there are five of them. These gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are massive rocks. Think about that. Ma massive rocks on the bottom of our arch. And on top of that is a cement floor called the Book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the historical biography of a person named Jesus. And do you remember what he said? He said, I will build my church. And that's the book of Acts. 
And now you know, therefore, since there's 27 books, the remaining, one, two, three, four, five, the remaining 22 books, all these are all letters, or as we call them, they're epistles. A man on the street was asked the question, well, who, who were the wives of the apostles? And he thought for a while, and he said, you know, I guess you'd have to call them the epistles. Well, you know, that's not true. They're the letters written by the apostles, not their wives. And the apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament epistles. In fact, he wrote this entire side of nine books and the top four books. He wrote all of them. The column on the left, this part here, they're all the same. They're all the same type. And they are called the Pauline epistles, because they're written by Paul, they're letters, to churches, to the church at Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and two letters to Thessalonica. You got it? They're church letters. The top four, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, those are called the Pauline epistles, because he wrote them, and they're all to pastors. First nine to churches, then four to pastors. You getting it? I want you to understand this. And finally, the remaining nine on the other column is typically called general epistles, and they're written to individuals, and there are nine of them. And they were written by James, Peter, John, Jude, and John. They're general letters. Let's make four further observations that will help you understand the layout of the New Testament. I want you to take your workbook now and just take some notes. These are some observations I've made over the years. If you were to draw a line like this, and across like this, you could see something very helpful. Look at all the books on this side of the line and all the books on the other side of the line. On this side of the line, the books are named differently than on that side of the line. On this side of the line, it's written and they're named because of to whom they are written. They are written to the church at Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, to Timothy, and Titus, and Philemon. But look at the rest of the books. They're not to whom, but they're instead, they're from whom? Who wrote those books? That is, they're from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from James, Peter, John, Jude, and Revel. No, no, not Revelation, but most of the books that fit that way. All right, let me erase that just for a minute. Look at these two columns one more time, because they both begin the same kind of book and they end the same kind of a book. The book of Romans and the book of Hebrews. These are the big doctrinal books of the New Testament. They have to do with doctrine. Romans is the major doctrinal books to the churches, and Hebrews are to the scattered individuals around the world. They're the doctrine. Let's make one other observation. Both columns begin with doctrine and they both end the same way. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians and Revelation are the same in that they're both prophecy books. Do you have do you have this in your mind? This is prophecy about the churches what's coming in the future, and this goes the entire world's history from the time John wrote it all the way to the new heavens and the new earth. How about just one more observation? And I hope you're feeling more and more comfortable about this, this New Testament arch, the historical books five, Pauline epistles to church, nine, Pauline epistles to pastors, four, and general epistles to individuals is nine. Now look at these columns one more time. Romans is the longest book, and it basically goes shorter, 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 shorter. And in most cases, Hebrews is the longest, and it goes shorter, 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 and Revelation is pretty long. And this is the longest book, and this is the shortest book. Well, that gives you the big picture. Now, I want to take a closer look with you about those 27 New Testament books and how they're arranged. And uh, we're going to get to work now. And I want to show you more practically, how do those books actually look practically when you just pull them apart and stack them? So let's take a look then at hmm, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. What are all these? That's right. Let's move this over here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. 
What are these? Well, these are the historical books. And this is all about the history of Jesus or the biography of Jesus. And he said, I will build my church. And that's the book of Acts. Well, the next group of books you know are written by Paul. And there are how many in that column again? Nine. Let's see if it works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this should be Romans to Second Thessalonians. And it is. All right. So let's put those over here. And who wrote these? That's right. Paul wrote these. And who did he write them to? He wrote them to churches. Nine Pauline epistles to churches. Then as the church grew older, Paul wanted to write some letters to the preachers and give them some instructions about how on earth do you lead a church. And there are how many on the top? The roof of the arch? Four. This should be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, because the Bible teaches that Philemon had a church in his home. And then as time went by, more and more people had questions and so forth. And there's a bunch of books, actually nine of them, called the General Epistles written to individuals. Well, that, there it is for you right there. Let's see if we can't just summarize that for you real quickly. This is called the historical books. And there are five of them, followed by the Pauline epistles to churches. And how many? There's nine. You getting this? We want this course to be so easy, so simple, so quick that you're really getting it. And these are the Pauline epistles to pastors. And there's four of them. And the general epistles to individuals. Well, we're going to come back in a few minutes and tear apart all these books and stack them in the order of not by the type like we just did, but by the time. Before teaching you more about the books of the New Testament, let's spend a few moments on the story of the New Testament. It breaks nicely into two halves. The first half focuses on the Gospels and the second half on Acts and the Epistles. But right now, I want you to sit back and just see the big picture. And you can look at it in your workbook and later on I'll teach it to you in such a way that you'll remember it. But right now, look on our map because this is where the first half of the New Testament takes place. And it has five parts to it. Number one is the early life of Jesus. And that's with Joseph and Mary who traveled down from their hometown of Nazareth to Bethlehem where Christ is born. That's where the angelic host are, the shepherds and the wise men. And they travel back up north to Nazareth where Jesus Christ grows up, probably working as a carpenter with his dad. The second thing is the ministry of John the Baptist, who's a close relative of Jesus and who preached repentance and baptized many people in the Jordan River down here near Jericho. And John prepared the way for Jesus and stated publicly, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and later baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Point number three the ministry of Jesus, which began when he was about 30 or 31 and lasted for three plus years. And he ministered in Galilee, Samaria, Judea, and every once in a while in Perea. And he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, did many miracles, taught lots of people. He preached boldly and he trained the 12 apostles. Point number four, at the end of Christ's life, there was so much rejection. This is the trials and the crucifixion of Jesus all within the last week. And it took place in Jerusalem after Judas betrayed him with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver. But as Jesus said, I'm not going to stay in the tomb. I'm coming back out. That's point five. The resurrection and ascension of Jesus when he arose three days after his crucifixion and appeared to more than 500 different people in Judea and in Galilee, including Doubting Thomas. And 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus ascended directly into heaven from the Mount of Olives, which is right across here, promising to return. All right, just a big picture again. Let's move to the second half. And let's summarize the book of Acts and the epistles through this map. The sixth part of the New Testament is the birth of the church to the Jewish people. And it occurred right here with the coming of the spirit on the day of Pentecost. The apostles spoke in tongues. Peter's famous sermon when 3000 Jews came to know Christ. Then the next point, number seven, is the church grew out of Jerusalem and moved north into Samaria. And it began with the evangelism of Philip and his preaching to the Ethiopian leader who found Christ. Then Paul himself 
in the same section in Acts, as he was traveling up to Damascus on the road, saw the bright light, came to know Christ, and later on was commissioned to take the gospel to the rest of the world, to the Gentiles. The next one is the missionary journeys of Paul to the Gentiles, where Paul started many new churches across the known world through his three missionary journeys to Asia, to Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and in Greece. Number nine, Paul's trials and imprisonment. And then Paul is tried in Jerusalem, and then he's tried up in Caesarea for a couple of years. Then he's sent to Rome for his big trial, and he's thrown into prison for a number of years, then released and sent back to Rome in the imprisonment. And the last one, number 10, is the global expansion of the church into eternity, described by the Apostle John. While a prisoner on the island of Patmos, when he's saying that people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation would come to know Christ before Christ returned at his glorious second coming. Well, now, with that in mind, let's go back to our Bible library to learn how the New Testament books fit together. As we did in the Old Testament session, let's organize these 27 books of the New Testament, not by type of books, which are the historical books, the Pauline epistles to churches, the Pauline epistles to pastors, and the general epistles to individuals, but let's change it and do it by the time and base it on the historical books. Unlike the Old Testament, which was over a thousand years, the New Testament only covers 100 years. And as you remember, the New Testament only has five historical books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and four of them are about the same period of time, the life and the ministry of Jesus. And there's only one other historical book that's supposed to deal with all the 22 different letters. How does it fit into the book of Acts? And do some of these letters take place after Acts is written? So this is going to be an exciting segment. How do the New Testament books fit together? Let's start over here. Let's take Matthew. That's the life of Jesus. And so is Mark, so you don't put it after it. It's all about the same period of time. And then so is Luke. But what's Matthew all about? What's Matthew all about? Matthew is all about Jesus, and it's written to the Jews, proving that he is their Messiah by the Old Testament prophecies. You see, there's four different Gospels because it was written to appeal to four different people. Mark was written to present Jesus to the Romans by his powerful actions, because Romans were like that, and the miracles that he did. And Luke, it, it, it was written to the Greeks, showing Jesus' wisdom and his grace and his profound teachings. And the Gospel of John it presents Jesus to the whole world, to everyone, and he is presented as a Savior to all who choose to believe. So that's the first part of the history of the New Testament. The next part we have is the book of Acts. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and here is how he builds it. And so the question is, how, how do the Pauline epistles to churches, nine, how does it fit in here? Well, Acts presents the birth and the spread of the church and all the sermons and the miracles of the apostles for many years. So how does it work? Well, was Roman written during the book of Acts? Yeah. And it presents the gospel from condemnation to salvation to sanctification and then to glorification. And 1 Corinthians, these are all about churches now. It corrects problems and answers, and it answers difficult questions that arose in a specific local church called the Church of Corinth. Well, as he answered those questions, there were some of his uh, people that disagreed with him. And in 2 Corinthians, he has to write another letter to the same church. And he has to defend his apostleship against his attackers. And he answers it because of his divine calling and his godly character. It's also written in the book of Acts, that same period. Another church, the uh, book of Galatians. And the book here refutes the errors of legalism and demonstrate the superiority of grace over law. Ephesians, a great doctrinal book. It extols the believer's position in Christ and exhorts believers to a life lived by means of the Spirit. Philippians is a book of joy, and it reports uh, to the church at Philippi Paul's difficulties in prison when he wrote this, and he encourages unity and he encourages humility among everyone. Colossians, another doctrinal book, presents the 
preeminence of Jesus Christ in creation and in redemption and on into eternity. And the last two books, as you remember, they're about prophecy. But 1 Thessalonians commends the church for their faith and teaches on the coming of Christ. 2 Thessalonians corrects some doctrinal misunderstandings regarding the day of Lord and what comes before it and after it. So they're all taking place during this same period. If you were to then move on to the pastoral epistles written by Paul, I have a question for you. Um, do they fit back here? No, they don't. They're written after that. The book of Philemon is the next one. It's written in the book of Acts. So it's written before this in time. And it's Paul's letter to a friend about a runaway slave who turns out to be a Christian. And the other book that fits in the book of Acts is this book way over here, the book of James which may have been the first book of the New Testament written. And it's all about this issue of your faith has to impact your works. Just don't talk it, but live it. So that finishes the book of Acts. Well, what happens next? Well, Acts ends in Acts chapter 28. But we made another book here that really isn't a book, but it represents the next period after the book of Acts, and we're calling it post-Acts. This is when we have the rest of the books. They all fit after Acts 28 takes place. 1 Timothy counsels Pastor Timothy on false teachers and uh, reminds him about the requirements to be a church leader. 2 Timothy, second letter to the same man, it challenges him to stand strong in the face of hardships and some pretty intense spiritual warfare. Titus to another pastor, it reminds him about the godly requirements for church leadership and to maintain good works in the church and keep preaching about them. The next book that comes is the book of Hebrews, and it demonstrates the superiority of Jesus and the new covenant that he started in comparison to the old covenant in the Old Testament. Then we have 1 Peter. It's the next book that's written. 1 Peter counsels and uh, gives comfort to those who are suffering, a lot of suffering here at this time in the church for their faith in Christ. But not only is there suffering, but there are false teachers. And so Peter writes another letter called Second Peter in which he confronts false teachers who are enticing believers to believe false doctrine and to enter into sinful behavior. And Peter really addresses it. First John explores the deeper dimensions of fellowship with God and that that fellowship with God must come out in one's love for other people. You can't just say you love God and don't love other people. Second John is a short book in which John um, commends his readers for their steadfast walk in keeping the apostolic doctrine that the apostles taught in the middle of some pretty tough days. Third John, very short, expresses gratitude to those who support traveling evangelists and missionaries and Bible teachers and encourages them to keep on. Jude is a fascinating book. It exposes false teachers by their conduct and by their character, and he predicts in this book what's going to happen in the judgment because of what they did. And Revelation, what a book this is. I've been studying this for years. It records what Jesus revealed to the Apostle John regarding the future, about the tribulation, about the second coming, about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Well, and there you have it. Now that you can see the answer to how do the New Testament books fit together, we're finally ready to take a brief look at one person that's all in this book, and all these letters and lives are all because of that one person. Before concluding the books of the New Testament, I would like to do something with you. I'd like to reflect on the primary person in every single one of those 66 books of the Bible. The Apostle John described this person with these words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and then the shocker, and the word was God. Who was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus Christ, the primary person, and called him the word, and the word was God. And because he is God, John wrote these words, through him, through Jesus, all things were made 
Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus did it all, 100%. The Apostle Paul described Jesus this way. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him, All things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. What powerful words. This means we live in a world where someone holds all creation together and that someone is Jesus Christ. Apostle John goes on to say the word became flesh, became a child and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus existed from eternity past, but left heaven, took on flesh in the form of a baby in a lowly manger. The eternal became physical. The supernatural was made natural. The intangible was made touchable. Everything stands or falls on this person, Jesus. You see, there's no doubt that Jesus is the most important person in history. So important, think about this now, that the entire world measures time from the year of his birth with B.C. and A.D before Christ and A.D. Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the year of our Lord. Jesus is the only hinge point of history. Who else but Jesus shook the world so powerfully, so massively that the entire world could do nothing but start the calendar all over again at zero at his birth. Jesus came as the light of the world that pierced the darkness. He came with the gift of eternal life in his heart. And because of that, he died on Calvary's cross to give that gift of forgiveness and forgiveness of sins to everyone who would but believe in him. Oh, how could you respond to this? Maybe the words of that famous song, all hail the power of Jesus name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all Jesus Christ, the same yesterday today and forever. Oh, amen and amen.